Good evening. I hereby call this special call meeting of the Board of Trustees for Greenville Independent School District to order. Let the record show that this meeting has been duly called and posted as the time, place, as required by Texas law. At this time, we have a, let the record also show that we have a quorum of board members present for this meeting. At this time, Reverend Brown, would you give us our invocation and pledge of allegiance? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we just come now saying thank you for your many, many blessings. And then, Father, thank you for not only waking us up this morning, but allowing us to be closed in our right mind. And then, Father, we thank you that you guided us to this meeting tonight. You kept us from dangerous scenes and unseen, and we thank you for it. Now, Lord, we're praying that this meeting would be pleasing not only to our entire district, but, Father, first to you. Father, we love you, we magnify your name, we lift you up. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Brown. At this time, we're going to have Ms. Helen Williams to introduce our forensic audit. Thank you, President Haynes. Good evening. I'm Helen Williams. I'm the Community Engagement Officer for Greenville ISD. It is my pleasure to introduce Sandy Alexander. Sandy's what he goes by. You will see Columbus on his name, but he likes Sandy. And uh, Mr. Alexander is an anti-fraud professional and a proud member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. His background includes big four accounting firm experience and private industry experience. He has earned expert credentials in information systems audits, forensic accounting, and fraud investigation. Mr. Alexander has extensive knowledge of generally accepted accounting principles and auditing standards. He has conducted peer reviews of big four accounting firms. He also has substantial experience in investigating fraud, misconduct, asset misappropriation, conflicts of interest, and financial statement fraud. He has served on advisory committees for Fortune 100 companies. We thank Mr. Alexander for being here this evening. Testing there. Huh? Uh, well, thank you for having me this evening. My, my thanks to the, uh, to the board, the school board, Dr. Liggins and to each of you for being here tonight. Uh, my name again is Sandy Alexander. I'm a CPA certified fraud examiner, and I've been asked to conduct a forensic audit of the GISD. Uh, Dr. Liggins, in the interest of keeping, uh, having a, um, a more lengthy Q&A session at the end, has asked me to keep my opening comments limited. So what I'd like to do is at least give a working definition of what a fraud investigation or a fraud audit is. Again, forensic anything is, is, as you would imagine, an investigation. In this case, an investigation of the books of uh, books and records or the uh, books of account for the uh, for the school district. Um, the scope of the examination: there are basically three broad categories. One's fraud, as you expect. Another is theft, and a third, even still, is misconduct. And misconduct, better defined, uh, would be uh, mismanagement. Also, abuse of position. The period under examination that I've requested is 
beginning on September the 1st, I believe, of 2014, which will allow for three full fiscal years of transactions to be pulled, plus a whole board for calendar year 2018, ending on or about January 31. What a, um, and, and we, we talked some, I mean, we, we have been visiting some, and I'm getting to know your, 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 your school board and, and, and the, the individuals quite directly uh, within the past hour or so. I just, uh, I'm new on board, so I haven't had I would, the benefit of, you know, the comments that have occurred here last August, I guess September, October, November, into December, and even the call for this audit. But I must tell you, a forensic audit is different from a third party audit. They are just not the same. Uh, each one, I've been doing this for 25 years, they're all different. You know, so when you're getting into it, you really don't know exactly where you're going to go. It's much like, I, and I've described this to Dr. Wiggins as, as, a, as a, if you can recall back these uh, pinball machines that you used to see the old arcade, where you would pull the ball back and it would bounce to the top and it would just bounce left, right, left, right, and you never really knew until it got to the bottom where it was going. These investigations are a lot like that. So with that, I will uh, turn the uh, session over to uh, Ms. Haynes, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and, and uh, I guess for the uh, comment period, and I would ask, please, I mean, your comments are important, but as quickly as we can get through the comments, I can come back up here, and I'm gonna be up here for the time that it takes to answer your questions. And that's really going to be the interactive portion of this. So please, and thank you very much. Thank you for being here. 
We appreciate you. President Haynes, at this time we'll be getting hearing from members of the public and I also wanted to introduce um, the people at the table here. Dr. Demetrius Lickens is the superintendent of Marine ISD. Laura McLean is the counsel from Walsh Gallegos who advises the school district and you've already met Mr. Alexander. So we have microphones set up either side, pick whichever side is most convenient for you. And you may face wherever you would like. If you'd like to face the audience, that's fine. Um, and we would like to get started. Again, there will be a three-minute limit to speakers. And Ms. Trina Stafford, the board secretary, is keeping track of time. And I think she even has some signs that she will um, put up to keep track of time. First, we will hear from Al Atkins. Good evening, Mr. Alexander, Madam President, board members, and Dr. Wiggins. Thank you for inviting us to speak directly to the order. As we know, with the change of leadership that came, a discovery GISD has a dire financial situation. Reflecting on past board meetings, especially one touting a West Coast visit with a futurist, as more issues are found, I have to wonder, was this crisis foreseen or was it just another problem to be solved? How much was intentionally withheld from this board? I doubt we will ever know. In addition to known non-reconciled cash accounts, other areas are suspect. Travel, incidentals, credit card usage, expenses, including that of former senior staff, the past director of communications, and CFOs who left in a sudden or questionable manner. Rumors indicate irregularities in the equipment of GISDPD, as well as extracurricular and morale boosting funds, such as the $50,000 China Goodwill trip, robotics and solar car expenses, and trailer mounted smokers. Please examine these accounts. The February 2014 order for the bond election and the ballot language included quote, construction of a new Bowie Elementary School, period. Not a school retaining the K-1 wing on the ballot. Every voter, in my humble opinion, was misled as a complete new school was never built and the legal ballot obligation will never be fulfilled. Please determine the legal basis for this misrepresentation and what happened to the funds affected by this change. In related project issues, there was at least three site changes, $200,000 of expenditures of tax debt, site and cost total over $1 million to operate the temporary camp buoy. These, in addition to construction changes, cost overruns, and technology spending all may be suspect. The order in paragraph D implied bonds would be sold as needed. After the election, the bonds were quickly sold at a premium, creating a $72 plus million dollar slush fund placed in the Techstar investment pool. Bids were not left for almost a year. The bulk of the bonds were sold at 5% interest. Simple math reveals the earned interest from Techstar, which is currently paying about 1.3%, does not begin to cover the interest on the bonds at the guaranteed 5% rate. What was the benefit or who might have benefited from those actions? Finally, based on statements in past open meetings, it appears for a few years operating in bond funds may have been commingled. There may be additional issues in that arena. In closing, I noted the trustees asked for a bulldog to conduct this audit. Mr. Auditor, I hope you are alive. I bring you alive. Your findings will help guide the district's future. Thanks for being here this evening, and as always, to the board and staff, thanks for all you do. Next, we will hear from Mr. Terry Drickers.
I too, sir, am glad you're here and hopefully now that we can move forward. And again, I don't want to echo because of the time that you're allowed. We've heard rumors of theft. We've heard rumors coming from teachers, staff, people writing checks to members who aren't a part of GISD. People walked out of their buildings. Accountants walked out of the buildings. Members that supposedly paid these checks sent home but not reprimanded. Sent home, quote our superintendent, maybe sloppy paperwork, I'm not sure what that means, but I trust that you'll be the man to find out. Sir, I hope that you're gonna set up a private office and a phone because I'm speaking for a lot of teachers tonight and I can hand you miles of paperwork and quotes from teachers and be more than glad to. That they're not satisfied or scared to maybe I should say to have to this administration because of bullying, because of being threatened, and they need an ally to come in here because a lot of them know where the problems are, know where they've been, and some of where the skeletons are hiding. So there's members of this community, sir, that's willing to pay for your office staff if needed, give you free lease space, give you phone, give you what you need or provide it for you. I'm not saying in our offices, where you choose for teachers can come to you and sit down and share with you or at least be able to contact you without having to be seen by this superintendent and some of the administration because of the fear. Now folks, we're here tonight because this board sitting right up here helped put us here. And I'm going to continue to remind you of this until we get every one of them removed. I would love to see a recall in a special election to get rid of this board. And then most of all, Mr. Liggins, I would like to see you resign too. In fact, I'm calling for that, sir, because you're not helping our current problem. Sir, there's people in this community that can help you, will help you, if you'll come out and ask or get where these teachers can get to you and provide you with the info you're looking for. And I'm glad you're including the first part of this year because I think there's some stuff there too that you'll find. But there's people that have been here a lifetime that I think will lead you in the direction to help you find what the community thinks might have happened. And again, thank you for being here, sir. Sarah Taylor. As a reminder, the only topic on the agenda this evening is a forensic audit, so please let's limit our comments to that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Taylor. I'm actually uh, brand new to the Greenville area. Uh, me and my family just purchased a home here in April. I'm a little nervous up here, so bear with me. Um, we moved here because of, uh, you know, the tax rates were lower than the surrounding areas, and we had high hopes in the school system, even though the ratings were significantly lower than the surrounding areas. Um, the, I have a, a younger son in elementary. He's actually going to the new buoy. We've been thoroughly impressed with that campus. Teachers seem to be doing well, you know, no problems there, but the middle school uh, have been sorely disappointed with just some conduct of the teachers. I don't, I don't mean to put the teachers down. I know their higher-ups are probably, you know, hard on them. Okay, I, this is just my voice for the, from my perspective, okay? Um, the maintenance issues I see on the middle school, not just there, but I see on the high school. Considering this is such a big district and booming, flourishing town, I don't understand why we don't have strong maintenance and growth in the school system. Madam, I'm going to ask you again, just the only item on the agenda today is a forensic audit. So if you could okay, well, let me just say this. Thank you. As being new to the area, I am thrilled that this audit is taking place. I, I, I've 
feel like we should come together as a community and stand strong. I'm satisfied to see the people in here, so many people in here, but I was hoping to see a full auditorium. If we can just share in, in the work that we need to put in to, to excel this area in our school district, let's do it. I'm in for it. God bless Greenville and the district. James Evans. I'm currently serving on the Greenville City Council and an acquaintance of serving on the GISD School Board. And the position of city manager is very much like that of school superintendent. Our city manager's number one job is being responsible for city finances. The city manager meets weekly with her finance director to review the basics, such as the amount of money and fund balance, revenue and expenditures. Their finance director presents these basic financial facts to the city council at both of our monthly meetings. City council monitors and holds our city manager responsible for the city's financial health. If the GISD board and the school district's office administrators had been doing their jobs instead of running all over town, putting on a Barnum and Bailey circus show, advertising how great GISD is, we would not be here tonight worrying about a forensic audit. Barnum and Bailey circus shows are expensive. GISD currently spends $247,800.24 on salaries for its public relations department. Numerous news articles have stated GISD employees would not receive raises this academic year due to the district going over budget in both last year's and this year's budget. To my surprise, current salary information from an open records request reveals that there were some raises awarded to certain GISD staff members this past summer. Some were sizable. My questions are, was the school board aware of and did they approve of these raises? Did the superintendent do this without conferring with the board? Who made the decision to not provide raises for the general employees? These select employee pay raises are a recent example of why GISD employees and the public in general question what is going on in GISD. If the city council and city manager were up here on the stage tonight facing a forensic audit and the financial crisis we are facing, the public would be demanding our resignations. I would remind the public to review the voting records of the board members to assist in deciding who needs to be replaced. I personally welcome Sandy Alexander of CA Forensics to Greenville and the GISD. Mr. Alexander, if I can assist in any way, please feel free to contact me. I just can't leave tonight without quoting the words of a former board member. It's better than it's ever been before. Thank you. Joe DeGarza. Good evening. Thank you again for coming up. So we were told in the May-June time frame that the 2016-17 budget was 6.4 million overrun. CPA group last month showed that we had a 3.8 million overrun. So we had 2.6 that we can't be that bad at guessers financially here at the district. So that 6.4 that, that we carried and talked to from May, June time frame all the way up until last month turned out to be 3.8 overrun for the 2016-17 school year. And you'll see that. So what I'm asking is, are our financials, as you dig into them, are they that messed up that we can't get any closer than 2.6 when we're estimating an overrun. Have we hit money or moved it between accounts so much that we can't find where that's coming from? Now, a lot of those people have moved on that I'll note here in a second, but 
that that's something that the new CFO, she, she's come up with some ideas. She's found some stuff. There's a big job, big job. Your help in that area will be appreciated. I'm sure you already know, but I just want to make, make sure. Previous CFO quit in or retired in December of 2016. Three months later, the previous superintendent quit, retired, 17. Dr. Liggins, new superintendent, came in in April. Time frame, the first CFO, the first interim CFO, was let go a month or two months later. The second interim CFO left in the, uh, August, I believe, when the new CFO came in. All of that to say, you can see that we've been in a, we have not had a very stable financial environment for quite some time. Internal controls, internal processes have been ignored as quoted in a TASBO audit that I'm sure they, they provided to you. It's terrible. So either we've gotten rid of the problem, we still have the problem, whether we know these board members are just accepting stuff that we put or that gets put in front of them. The CPA, they had a, a page 27 that was from last year. Wasn't even in the current year numbers that we had. And we accepted their report. Something's got to change there. I have some information that I'm going to email to you at your website there. It's some public information that I requested. It shows all the checks that were mailed out one January or whatever that pay period was. Usually they get paid on the 13th and 27th. All of 2017. So what I did was I just went and looked to see what the difference in that first pay and the last pay of the year. There are, some, there are some people that received extra pay or an extra check that was received. That's just something to keep in Look at. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone else would like to make a comment during this part of the meeting, please fill out a yellow card. Otherwise, we'll move on to a Q&A. Well, at this time, Dr. Liggins, Ms. McLean, and Mr. Alexander will be fielding questions from the audience. Please come forward if you have any questions. that you're going to cover. It, it, it's with the bond. Do you have plans to ensure that everything that was ordered on PO can be accounted for? And I'm talking down to the stainless steel ovens and stuff. If we order 10, can we count on 10? That you can find 10. And I only say that because of rumors that some are ordered <laughs> and taken off site to people's house. That's just, the, that's just if you have intentions to look that far into the bond stuff. Are you asking about uh, confirmation of material counts, for example? Quantities of items that have been purchased under the bond program? Right. right. Uh, would these materials have been incorporated into a construction site or a building of some type? What I'm asking specifically about is, what I'm asking specifically about is 
a stainless steel, the stuff that the cook has here in the new kitchen, that, that type. If, if we order 10 stoves here, do we have eight? Where are the other two at? That, that's what I'm asking. Well, the, the bond issuance was back in 2014, is that correct? Yeah, but that, that's what I have. Yeah, May of 2014 is when it was approved, I believe. Yeah, and, and Dr. Liggins and I, we've talked about the, the nature and scope of a forensic audit uh, for the GISC. As I talked about, you know, earlier looking at the, uh, uh, or examining the uh, books and records, the accounts and so on, uh, the, the bond issuance, you know, is, is I think we, we referred to as an agreed upon procedure, something that would be an add-on to the forensic audit, and how extensive that's going to be is yet to be oh, determined. Okay. But certainly, if you have any any specific allegations regarding that, uh, those will be incorporated into whatever work is done. Okay. Uh, but with regard, when you ask, will I look at everything? I mean, to go back and look at everything, you know, for example, I talked about three full fiscal years of transactions, right. plus a rule forward, you know, for six months for 2018. Right. But to go back and look at every transaction that, that's been entered, you know, and, and adjusted and deleted and revised and reclassed would take me years to right. go back and do oh, that much. in terms of man hours. So, I mean, the, 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 the audit involves judgment and selection on accounts. And certainly to the extent that uh, you and other members of the audience can point me specifically to concerns that you have, I will make sure that those are addressed before the, this audit concludes. Uh, but, but again, I, I can't give an assurance that I will go back and look at everything because I typically just simply don't do that. Right. I mean, if the time doesn't allow for that, the budget doesn't allow for that. Right. You know, and it's just not the, the, the normal way to approach a, a forensic or any kind of audit quite directly. Does that help? Does it answer your question? Yeah, that's pretty much what I thought. Right. I mean, because I know you can't go back through each one, uh, each transaction, and I know you have to limit your scope. Uh, un un understand. Well, so, again, again, it's not meant to be a scope limitation. It's right. just when you ask, well, I look at everything yeah. that's been purchased. And, and maybe I'll have a better example of a specific time or a specific piece of equipment sure. to, to do that. I don't have that information right now. Well, and, and by the way, maybe an uh, example, cash disbursements, a check register, right, that are made by the district. You know, certainly I, I am, I've had pulled all the checks that have been issued by the district since uh, September 1, 2014 through uh, January 26, I believe. Not only for the accounts payable vendor files, but also for the payroll, so, which yeah. is a separate bank account, right, and so on. Uh, you know, there are a number of things that go into examining those. I test, you know, the, the cash disbursements journal, right. um, you know, back to the actual bank account. I look at, you know, statements. Uh, I look for errors and omissions, irregularities in that. I also, you know, compare uh, addresses, you know, for common mailing addresses. And, right. And uh, employees, common social security numbers, look for ghost employees. I mean, there are a number of things that are done, but they're done on a sample basis. Right. And that's the same thing with the checks out of sequence and, you know, a computer-issued check getting backed out and then not so much a handwritten check but a check from a different account that shows up in the check register. Several of those that I've seen going through, at least from 17, on a couple of individuals that, that was, was backed out and then uh, another check was written. And again, you know, if you can be very specific oh, with that after this meeting, oh, yeah. I think you indicated yeah. earlier that you have some materials that you'd like to email. Yep. Oh. Uh, and if we could speak as well, I want you to give me a ch give me a chance to look at the content of that email. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Does it help? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming up tonight. Mr. Alexander, you used earlier in your opening statements, you used the word uh, abuse of power. Yes. Abuse of power, abuse of position is correct under misconduct. If a school board member bought a piece of real estate from the property tax attorneys for the school and didn't go through proper channels, would that pass the smell test? Well, taken out of context, I, mean, I, I would really have to look at the entire transaction. You would, to be fair. Yes, sir. Mr. Liggins, I have a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. Has there any been, been any misappropriations of funds that you're aware of? 
I'm not aware of any, no. Not aware of any. You haven't let anybody go for that reason? Not for, I can't speak on personnel issues, but I've not let You said enough for the purpose you of. You answered my question. Of misappropriation of funds. Yeah, you yeah. answered my question. I, I would ask that the administrators, as well as um, uh, Sandy next to me, be allowed to finish their answers. Yes, ma'am. We're you. all lawyered up, ma'am, I understand. No, I'm, it, it, may I add, please? Yes, sir. Uh, am I early on? I'm getting some feedback on them. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm rising. But uh, uh, one of the things that I asked Dr. Liggins about, and I got assurance from before signing the contract with the school district, was an understanding that uh, the district's tolerance for theft or fraud or misconduct is zero. Thank you. So if that is noted by me, it will be documented and rolled into the report, and you'll be able to read about it to the, to the extent it's allowed by law. Thank you. Certainly. And are you aware that the county firm that the school now uses that gave the wrong report to the school board a month ago in 2013 was sued from a school just south of here for the same type for all? Well, I actually do my own due diligence. Uh, again, before contracting with the district, there were a number of things that I did to, uh, to learn more about the individuals that are key personnel and key service providers back to the district to, to make sure that I wanted to contract with the district as a type of uh, an organization that uh, I, I would like to do a fraud examination for. And yes, I am aware. Thank you, sir. I think you're a man. Mr. Alexander, if you don't mind, could you provide a little more clarification on the extent that you're going to review the bond? You, you had just said there were some agreements that things were going to be accepted. Yeah, yes, sir. The, the only discussion that we have had, and again, we're still in the planning phase of this, the actual field work for the forensic audit doesn't begin until next week. So at this point, we have met, we've had a preliminary meeting, one only on, on site. Uh, to include Dr. Liggins uh, and Ms. Haynes. Uh, that lasted for about two hours. Uh, and then Dr. Liggins and I have talked by phone a few times, and I've met with his CFO, uh, Ms. Reeves, who has agreed to act as the project coordinator. And uh, through her, I've requested a number of documents. I think uh, I have about 13 to 15 categories of information that I've already requested. About 200 documents, as I understand, it's been pulled and are waiting you know, for my review. But again, I'm still in the planning phase. A big part of what is going to go into the final plan for this examination before it starts next week, the field board portion of it, are the comments time. You know, and certainly the bond issuance that uh, has, has been mentioned has only been uh, mentioned to me in passing. There's been nothing, nothing specific said about it. Uh, it was, uh, I think, first mentioned, Dr. Lincoln's, if correct me if I'm wrong on this, but on the 24th, you know, we talked about it. Uh, and uh, he said that he would like to see that included, but without you know saying more about that. And again, I'm yet to learn anything about the bond issue. As I understand, there was you know, back in 2014, uh, one of the things when I look at you know at the uh, the break of continuity, the, uh, the the lack of so-called succession planning, and so on that, that appears to be within the uh, operational side, the finance side, is you've had a number of you know, administrators, you've also had a greater number of CFOs. You know, and when you look around, it looks like it's hard to find, it might be difficult to find someone that was here back when that occurred. But, uh, but I will, you know, again, I, I, I don't think I'm answering your question very well. Well, and I, w I was just looking for the clarification because at the last meeting when the board approved the forensic audit, the motion was specifically modified to include review of the bond. Oh, sir. For, sir. for misappropriations, for proper accounting methods and procedures. And for losses. So I, I hope, as the scope is finalized, that the bond will be given a full review. No, and there should be no hope to that. That, that is a virtual certainty that will happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Tish Woodruff. I have five children, all who have attended GISD, and I still have, currently have children in GISD. And I'm new to coming to these meetings, so forgive me if my questions sound a little 
I don't know, silly, I guess. But I'm not understanding the procedures between the superintendent and the board of how the budget could be so far over and it keep going continuously without any um, recommendations from the board or from the superintendent on how to rectify the problem instead of the problem keep going year after year. And now our teachers are the ones who have to take the brunt of this. Not the admin office or the superintendent, it's the teachers. So can you explain to me the checks and balances? Not, not, that's not particularly related to the what Mr. Alexander does, but I would be more than happy. Or Helen or Amy or someone, if you could give them their contact information, I'd be more than happy to call you to my office or meet you someplace. Oh, I'd love to meet Speak you. one on one. Yes, yes. ma'am. Great. Thank you. You're well, and, and may I add before you move away, please, because you did make reference to checks and balances. Yes. Uh, that internal controls, employee roles, and responsibilities are considered during the course of a forensic audit. It's not just taking any time on numbers. So, so yes, checks and balances will be considered. And you will review what checks and balance have been in place and which ones have not been followed? Well, it's tough to review for something. That, it's tough to, to see something that no longer exists. I mean, one of the things that has occurred here with the recent changes both in HR and finance is both of those key individuals are new, I believe, from last uh, October, November, if I'm not mistaken. And just in early conversation with them, they've made quite a few changes. So the accounting shop today no longer looks like the accounting shop from last August, September. Uh, so to that extent, I will have to rely on interviews with uh, subordinates, if you will, individuals that have been here, you know, uh, as the, these changes in, in administration have occurred, these changes in CFO. But, um, but again, you know, the, the, your, your comments are well taken. When I first heard this, you know, the fact that it occurred, you know, and is now recurring, if you will, and hasn't been corrected, uh, I'm not, I'm very unclear on what's causing that, and I'm as concerned as you are. You know, and I certainly will not walk away from this audit until that has been properly addressed and we're able to give a good explanation back to you and the rest of the community. How long will it take you to conduct the audit? Uh, not not sure. In terms of money, there's a not to exceed of seventy five thousand. So and, and my billing rate is fixed and certain. So the dollar amount is is locked in. The amount of time, if you will, uh, and, and and again, I think the dollar amount is more than sufficient. The dollar amount, as a matter of fact, is the dollar amount that I asked for. You know, and and I gave some assurance at the front end uh, that this examination would not cost the district more than the seventy five thousand that's been approved for this. Uh, but the amount of time depends, you know, on the, in terms of you know, calendar days and stuff, the availability of staff for interviews. Uh, by way of example, I had requested an interview tomorrow with the HR chief, who I now understand is on vacation this week, so that will be next week. Condition of the books and records, those are sight unseen at this point, and also the cooperation of staff. Uh, easier to cooperate with me sometimes on the front end than it is in the tail end as things get a little tighter, if you will. But uh, that drives the amount of time that it takes. Plus, any type of interruption, work stoppage, if you will, that can occur. And by way of example, if I request a, a document production pull and those documents are not ready for my review, I stop the audit for the time that it takes for that work to be completed before I come back on again. Uh, so I'm expecting that it will be completed uh, not in the month of February, yet the field work starts next week. Uh, but I would imagine the middle to the end part of next month, March. And will we have another meeting for you to discuss your findings? Uh, that will be at Dr. Liggins and the Board of Trustees choosing. Uh, my, my, uh, the picking order on this, the contract is styled uh, between my firm uh, and the district with Dr. Liggins being the individual that is, is the key person, if you will. So my reporting uh, will go directly back to Dr. Liggins, who in turn can share that, uh, presumably, with the board of uh, the school board. Uh, and then if they're choosing, if they decide to have me back, uh, then I certainly will be here. Okay, thank you. Sure. And it is our hope to, to release the findings of the audit. It may, depending on the forum, it may not be in board meeting, it may be if we're not absolutely sure at this point. But they will be, the findings will be released thank to the public. You. Yes, ma'am. My name is uh, Lauren Saxton. I'm a 
cyber security and senior analyst for T-Mobile. And I had some questions regarding, um, you mentioned there a little while ago, Mr. Alexander, that this is a little more than a financial audit. Would this, the breadth and scope of this, um, cover possibly any cyber intrusion or segregation, segregation of data and privacy issues, especially concerning any charter accounts? Maybe going back a couple of years, would, would they, does, it, does it touch on that or would it be very limited in scope? Well, just as an FYI, my, uh, for those that have looked at my CV, which I think there was a link on the uh, one of the online papers to the, the, my, my CV uh, that was published a few weeks ago, uh, my experience has shown, and it's kind of a page at a glance, but it goes back to what I would call qualifying experience for the work that I do now. Uh, and I think the earliest shown position is with a big four accounting firm. Uh, if you were to go back before they had one job, and it's only one job even still, I'm a former systems engineer with a EDS, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and also a certified information systems auditor. And uh, and part of what I do, you know, in the course of doing a forensic audit is also to address the IT side. Mm -hmm. So uh, internal controls, you know, program change controls, um, backups, disaster recovery, things like that. Uh, passwords, IDs, uh, access, authorization from one application to the other, firewalls if you're willing to prevent one from uh, having too much access. But in terms of cyber intrusions and things like that, I really don't get into that. I mean, if you feel that like there's been those events that have occurred, uh, that can be addressed, but probably not through the forensic audit by me. There's also been, I guess, um, you'd also mentioned there's been some movement employees in and out of the district for some time. Is there any, would, you, would, your, would your audit uncover potentially data that's been moved? Because some people have maybe, there's some warnings that work for them, their secretaries and they're in administration and they may move out of the district completely. Is there a chance that data would go with them? Information would go with them? Would you uncover that as well? No, I don't think, you know, the, the forensic audit really is more of a financial, as I said, looking at the financial affairs, not so much the IT. Even IT, as I understand it, you know, doesn't fall within the accounting domain. I, I believe IT, and correct me please if I'm incorrect, but reports to the assistant superintendent, and it's a separate offshoot. Uh, it's a little different for me to see it like that, but, but so I'm happy to reach out. And again, I've already requested an interview with the IT exec, I believe, for early afternoon tomorrow. But, um, but in terms of data removal, data theft, thumb drives, that's what you're asking about? Yes, yeah, similar issues. People that have walked off the confidential information, employee ID, social securities, numbers and all? Yeah, that, and it's, if it's related to financial, it wouldn't just have to have an ID sure. control around it. It could yeah. also have bits of financial information, yeah. especially if these people were in payroll, for instance. Now, and my questions in that area, my inquiries would be directed back at the IT exec and exactly what controls are in place or not. And to the extent those controls are not in place or sufficient to preclude that, then that would be a reportable event. That's what I, that was the question I had. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jan Rosenbaum. I am a product of the Brambles Independent School District. I taught in this building for 20 years. My son worked for the Independent School District for Greenville for 10 years. That being said, I have a vested interest in this school. It's mine, and I want it to be the bright and shiny school that it was when I graduated in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's very important to me that that happened. And as a school teacher, I tried my best to teach my students that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That being said, I want to know if anything is discovered of a criminal nature, no matter whether it's one cent, will charges be filed against the person or people involved? And whose decision would that be? Well, one penny is a small amount, but Dr. Liggins has assured me that zero tolerance is zero tolerance. So any theft, any fraud, any misconduct uh, is a reportable event. 
to the extent, and again, my reporting will be in a written report at the conclusion of this examination back to Dr. Liggins, who in turn will share that, again, presumably with the school board. Uh, my, to the, again, I think you're asking specifically about individuals that are found to be Negligent in their duties. Criminally negligent in their duties. Uh, those, those individuals will be included in the report. The dollar amount that has been identified as misappropriation uh, will be included, and then a referral will be made for that. Um, typically, I, I will you know, refer you know, or a recommendation for referral uh, to a district attorney's office. Uh, in some instances, the Department of Justice, it just depends. You know, on where the funds are, the amount of money, you know, and what the event is as to what the referral would be. As to whether or not that referral goes forward to law enforcement will be up to your school board. And I can, and I don't speak for the board often, but I can speak for myself and the board in this instance. We are committed to, should there be criminal negligence that is proven, to move forward with charges on that individual. No matter who it is, where it comes from, bottom line. Yes, ma'am. Because, you know, our students, the young ones, the people in this town, they deserve to know that there's going to be repercussions and that you pay. That's what's wrong with our society today. People don't pay for their actions. And I think it's time that we do it. Thank you. My name is Jackie Merrick. I'm kind of like Jan. I've taught and subbed here for over 20 years. Travis is my heart. I mean, I would do anything for that school. I live and die at that school. It's the only place I work. But my question is, all of these people who have left the district, and we've all seen them just peel out, just as fast as they could possibly go, how many CFOs have we had since our last superintendent? I mean, that's not right. Most CFOs stay unless they're just offered something like one of ours was at Lovejoy. I mean, they don't just move to another district within two years. Something's happening, and these CFOs need to be contacted, and the other people in our district need to be contacted, because why has everybody left so quickly since Dr. Lemons, who came, to give us support and revamp and renew our district, why would our central office feel like this? I mean, something's not right. And those are the people that I hope that you continue to go down the line and talk to about what has gone on in the past several years. Well, I certainly, during the course of scope of an examination, do interview personnel. And it's my full intention to reach out to these individuals that you're making reference to that no longer work here uh, to see if they would be willing to talk with me. But again, all interviews, whether it's with current or former employees, are voluntary, so they can decline to speak. But I do reach out. So there's nothing at any point that even if criminal actions have been found, that these people aren't subpoenaed, or they don't have to come back and account for maybe what part they partook in this district of us being short the money we're short? No, Is that I'm, what you're telling me? No, I certainly am not telling you that. <laughs> uh, I understood that you were, you were concerned that because these individuals are no longer here, that their voice would not be included, uh, and, and their reasons for departure and so on would not be considered. Uh, and that certainly is not the case. Uh, certainly any wrong doing, regardless, and the fact that the person is no longer here uh, with the district uh, has absolutely nothing to do uh, with the fact that if they in fact did commit, uh, uh, commit a crime, that they should be held accountable. Absolutely. Okay. You know, and, and one of the concerns quite directly, and I discussed this with Dr. Wiggins and, and uh, the CFO as well early on, down the 24th, was that there's been so much talk about you know the budget overrun, the six million, if you will, plus the roll forward uh, three or so. That my concern was then, you know, that the focus of this community would be more on that and not all the other. When in fact, I do look at all the other. Yes. You know, and 
And I, I would not want the expectation to be from the school board or from the Greenville ISD community uh, that a, you know, the cost that's being incurred here, the work that's being done, you know, is only for that. I mean, when, when the report comes out and there are other things in it, especially if there are any other things in it, uh, I, I wouldn't want that to, to, to be seen as, as unnecessary work, if you will. Uh, when in fact it's speaking exactly what you're talking about now. And, and again, it will be included. Well, as you go forward, do we just wait for the board to give us a report or or the superintendent to give a report or are we as the public or employees or whatever going to hear what goes down the line? Or are we going to wait for a you know 30 page report that if you don't go to the board meeting, then you don't know what's going on? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and quite directly, you know, in the conduct of conducting this investigation, I typically don't share uh, my findings, uh, which during the course of the examination until it's concluded will remain preliminary findings mm -hmm. until the work is done. At the conclusion of which, before any report is written or drafted, I will sit and speak with Dr. Liggins in a, a informal setting to do a verbal readout with him, uh, point to the findings, uh, and then to uh, discuss with him where there are recommendations for corrective action or referrals, if you will, the best way to proceed with that. Understanding that my idea is not always the best idea, it just needs to be the right idea for the district. So to, to kind of go back and forth with that. And only at the conclusion of that, once we have a meeting of the minds, uh, will I draft that report. Uh, the report, once I draft it, is reviewed by my business attorney. Uh, and then, and only then, do I put my name on it, and it's given to Dr. Liggins for the first time. And he will see it then, only for the first time. And that's when the opportunity exists for him to go forward and share it with the, you know, the school board. And, and how they handle that, I mean, it's, it's a good question, but perhaps Dr. Liggins, you can yeah. speak to that. At that point, depending on, I mean, what's ever a little bit legally allowable, we want to absolutely release to the public. It has not been decided yet whether that will be done in a public forum such as this, it will be in a regular board meeting, whether it be posted online, whatever the form, that hadn't been decided at this point. But it definitely will, is something that the board and I want to make sure it's shared publicly with our community. Additionally, this is something that, um, Mr. Alexander mentioned that I was gr greatly appreciated. Should, um, should my name be mentioned, for example, as a superintendent uh, in the audit as doing something fraudulent, um, then I would not be the one to receive the report. It would go to uh, my authority, which is the board. And so uh, it's a very honest, uh, transparent process to where um, it will, it, it is something, in, um, Anything legally allowable, I will make absolutely sure that um, our public is fully aware. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you have already answered, Mr. Alexander, the question I was going to ask. If your audit findings reflect that you need to contact previous superintendent, the three CFOs, HR, and there's another administration person that left as well. If your audit findings find that you need to gather further information from them, you will be reaching out to them. No, I, uh, maybe I misspoke if you understood it that way. I uh, will not be doing that because of audit findings. I will be doing that because of the audit. Okay. With or without findings. Okay. All right, perfect. So the 3.8, that you just mentioned, uh, the, the audit, where actually you said the six million overrun is what you thought the whole issue. So if you go back to the board minutes from, I don't, I can't recall right off the top of my head, but so what the previous superintendent asked the board and was approved by 5-2 vote was for an open checkbook of 1.5 million for the steel building to be built. That's where you're going to find that that 3.8 million overrun for 2016-17 all originates from there. From that, he estimated 1.5 is what it was going to cost to redo the place out there, the old PJC building. It ended up costing 3.5. And then there were smaller underruns as well. 
that you can go back and see financials were asked for six months in a row two, three, four board members. It continued to get passed. The project continued to get passed along by collectively four threes, five two votes without looking at all the financials to keeping up with, instead of giving the open check of 1.5, you know, that's where I believe you're gonna find a lot of the overrun. But I think it's a little bit bigger than, I mean, that, we said it was 6.4 million, but there's 2.6 that we said there was an overrun somewhere, and then just last month, we come back and we don't have an overrun. Two months in because of bad budgeting, two months into the fiscal year this year, we go from 41 to 45 million on budget, increase revenues by 1.2 or 1.3, and we have a 2.7 million overrun for 17, 18. Projected after two months, after two months, because we didn't budget, but a lot of that is because the CFO quit, the superintendent quit, and they probably quit on the budgeting process when, when the first one started peeling out. As Tasbo said, you're supposed to start, and I'm sure Dr. Liggins and the other uh, administration has already started the budgeting process. They recommend that it starts in January. We didn't even get started until June and just took the same budget. And, and I know you're gonna be looking into that and that's why it was amended. But it, it's more than that 3.8 because I think that's fairly easy because you can get a lot of that to the STEM bill. Okay. And again, regarding the minutes, uh, you're confident that that information you said about the minutes earlier is documented in the minutes? It is in the, it is in the Back to what calendar year? Uh, that's, uh, I'll send them to your app. I'll send them to you off of the board website. I don't have, I should have brought all my stuff. With well, as an FYI, the, uh, the first item requested was the board minutes. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Starting back in September of 2014, uh -huh. uh, through December, yeah. uh, approved board minutes. So they're, yeah. they're privately signed and so on. If I need to go back further than that. It's, it's within asking. that time frame. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's thank within you. that time frame. for the attorney in the middle. Is the school attorneys set to go forth with filing charges if, the, if these are found? Because I, I have a feeling that you'll see the report. Well, I, I suspect that would be the case that I would see the report, but any decision, sorry, any, any decision with respect to moving forward in taking uh, the findings of our auditor here needs to be made by the district itself. And that is a decision that is made by the board generally. And the public's fear at this point would be as our board has turned their head for months and done nothing until the public pushed them forward, which they would probably do again, or Mr. Ligon would just show them what he wanted them to see. Opinion. Mr. Alexander, my phone is blowing up as I sit here as people's watching it from Facebook. There is businesses willing to pay you above and beyond the $75,000 that the school has allowed you if needed to be hired on a separate contract at the end of your findings. If that's even legal, don't know. But I'm telling you right now, there is people in this community, me being one, that do not mind contributing to this $75,000 to get it done and get it over with and shake the rabbits out of the hole if they're there. Well, and may I add, and I don't normally uh, say this, but um, my commitment back to my client in this engagement, again, the number 75,000 is the number that when asked, I gave Dr. Liggins. If that number proves not to be a true number or sufficient to cover my billing rate, uh, then I write off the difference. So, but I appreciate the offer. Thank you again, you say like our man. Thank you. I second that motion as well. One of the questions I had was the TASBO audit that was put in the paper. I remember, I remember distinctly it was mentioned that it was um, edited and possibly redacted for the community. One of the concerns I'm going to have with this audit, and maybe the board, if there's any board members present, is that 
This particular one, since it's so thorough, we're paying so much money for it, I prefer it not to be tampered with, redacted, edited, dumbed down for us. If it goes in the paper, I'd like it to be this entirety. Most of us, if we don't know what the meaning of something is, we'll seek the advice and the community's advice on it. We don't really want it to be edited, changed, tampered with in any way. We'd like the, the, real, the meat from the horse's mouth, the information front. Well, I also saw the uh, the article regarding the TASBO report and the comments regarding submitted for edit and so on. Uh, I can assure you, I was stunned when I read that. You know, and I just simply don't do that. And I have never had even one report given to a client where I've asked for their point of view on the report. Once I write it, once I sign it, it's done. You know, and, and I don't show the report. It's not previewed. It's not passed over to uh, to their attorneys. And, you know, trustees and things like that. It, it is what it is. You know, and certainly, I, uh, I, my, my profession, I live and die by that. You know, so there, there were not be any editing on this. There were not be any in, in to make changes and make it sound better and so on. Uh, if anything, they, uh, they're, they're very bluntly written and very matter of fact. Does that answer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also for the confidence of the community, I would like to beseech Mr. Dr. Liggins. Um, if there's a preliminary result, he mentioned it won't go final. It could, you know, it could be six months before the, between the preliminary and the and the final. If you could give the community some insight into that, that will really go a long way to their confidence in this. So they see they see progress being made. They see the value of the seventy-five thousand dollars. They see if they need to spend more money, and the community is coming forward. They'll see the value in that, and that's going to that's going to win real points with the confidence in the community. Just a point of clarification, sir. Um, I didn't want you to leave with a misimpression or have the audience leave with a misimpression. Um, the information that will be provided by the auditor to the district certainly is something that is his own work product, meaning that the district does not have a hand in what is said or how it's said. Uh, to that end, though, to the extent to which the district in turn can release that information, the district has obligations under law with respect to certain information that may be considered confidential. And so that does limit, unfortunately, sometimes, depending on what the substance is, and depending on what that law is as it relates to that substance, it may not be something that can be released to the public. So I'll give you an example. If there is documentation that has social security numbers of individuals, whether current or former, we redact that information. So I just don't want you to leave or the members of the community to leave with an impression that it's a wholesale release. Because unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at the law, there are provisions that are mandated under the law that mandate that certain information is confidential. Absolutely. I wouldn't imagine the community would be um, worrisome about you tripping up on the social security numbers. I think they were more, more so about the vol voluminous pages and the detail. That's what we're looking for, not going back and changing paragraphs and things like that. I understand having to protect. That's kind of what I do for a okay. living, too. Okay. Back in. <laughs> Since I spoke, my phone has been blowing up from teachers that I taught with here for 20 years. And um, a lot of them are very concerned because they would really like to speak to you but they are afraid to come to you in any kind of a situation to where they could be recognized by anybody from central office or anybody on the school board. So I ask that you please make yourself available in some form or fashion to these teachers who would really like to voice their opinions and help you along the way because they're the ones that have been here for 20 years. They're the ones that have seen everything going through, not the ones in and out of central office all the time. The root of this school district is the teachers in this building that have stayed for so long because they care about the school. And those are the ones you need to talk to. And if I could trouble you to meet with me after tonight's meeting so that we can exchange information, contact information, and perhaps you can help me get the address. That would be awesome. I would be more than glad to. I have retired and I got the time. Thank you, sir.
James Evans, and my question is for the school board. Right now, we put a cap of $75,000 on this audit by Mr. Alexander. I have been to every school board meeting just about for decades, literally decades, worked here 44 years. Missed very few meetings. I've seen this board last spring, one occasion, make a budget amendment for $900,000 and some few cents. We had board members, people that were, I hope, stay on the board, ask questions. What's this amendment? What is, are the specifics of the amendment? Answer, that's a good question. If we'd known you wanted to know that, we would have provided it for you. The next month, they went ahead and voted. They got the votes to pass, they got a majority. The next month, it was 800,000. It was last spring when the STEM school was being built. We found money for field trips to China. Great trip. Did we have the money for it? Apparently, on the credit card. I would hope that if this audit, Mr. Alexander, I appreciate your professionalism by saying that you would do it on your own if it exceeded 75,000. I would hope the school board, and I would ask the school board to answer, will you be able to find the money if Mr. Alexander comes and says we need to do more? Will this board, will this board back him and support him monetarily to get the job done? That's my question to the board. And may I interrupt, please? And I know yes. you're not directing your question to me, but that is just not going to happen. As I said, you know, I, I do a certain amount of pro bono work, community work, if you will. Yes, sir. Uh, the number was asked and given by me to 75,000 as a firm number. Uh, I, I, I don't believe at this point that it's going to go over that, but certainly if it does to the extent that it needs to, it will. And I will just simply adjust it off. But I will not put the school district in a position of having to compensate me more than 75 for this work. Mr. Alexander, as Mr. Drew has said, I think you're the man to do the job. I look forward to you being here. I look forward to working with you. And again, uh, Mr. Driggers, thank you for paying for Hunt County News to sponsor this the last several meetings. Terry Driggers, welcome. Hunt County News, thank you. Mr. Alexander, I'm Dwayne May. How are you? Got a question. How will you approach the capital expense line items in the budget, and how many years back will you go on those budgets? Capital expenses. Uh, Anything in particular? Expenditures such as uh, purchases, equipment, all of the sub line items that falls under that uh, capital improvement. Uh, well, again, you know, the, the, this audit. Uh, Again, I haven't completed the, uh, the audit approach plan on this, but when asked to do this, typically a, a, a forensic or fraud audit, if you will, uh, there's predication you know, where some, there have been allegations someone has done something. Uh, an employee is found to have stolen you know, 15, 20, 30,000 uh, and, and terminated, and then they bring someone like myself on board at the instruction of the board uh, to, uh, to prove it up. Uh, and to make ready as for a referral back to a district attorney or DOJ or something like that. But uh, in this case, you know, it, it lacks uh, predication. There are, no, there are no allegations specific that have been given to me prior to tonight. Uh, so in talking with Dr. Liggins, the approach, you know, in, in terms of the work that needs to be done, has been kind of the sources and uses of cash, if you will. You know, on the sources side, you're looking at cash receipts, and I plan to do very little work with that on the balance sheet side. Uh, and I, I don't mean to get you know, too technical with these terms, but the focus is going to be on cash disbursements, uh, starting with you know, the, uh, the vendor payroll account, the operating account, if you will, and for all cash disbursements that are made regardless of uh, whether they're of a capital expenditures or not. Uh, and uh, the same type of thing with payroll. Uh, 
and, and then it, it gets back into even small things like petty cash, but that will be a, a nominal part of it. I don't think I answered your question. Will you, I guess it's what I'm looking for, is how, will you go back as far as 14 where you can parallel those budgets or those capital expenditures and parallel when the actual bond, uh, bond money hit the bank? Oh, so if we're talking about the bond issue. No, I'm not talking about the bond money. I'm talking about the annual fiscal budgets back to 14 that has their capital expenditure line items in those budgets because you've had an influx of cash of about $72.5 million to go in an account. So if you've commingled money and taken money out of bond money to operate on, you've got your capital expense side open that you normally would use to operate on. And if that money is free because you're operating out of the bond money, then you could use, possibly use those capital funds that you would have in that line item budget, maybe for other things. And let's say that occurred. No, how in depth are you going to look at those line items back to 14 to parallel when that money hit the bank? Well, that's what I'm asking. What is the value added back to you in doing that? Pardon? What is the value added back to you in doing that? To see if there's any misappropriations of that capital expenditure line items. Even though it was properly authorized for disbursement or payment? I don't care if it was, if it was authorized or not. I'd like to look at it to do a smell test to see if... Uh, some of those line items uh, were used properly. Well, again, a smell test, yes. I mean, the, as we talked about before, you know, it's, it's time never allows to go back and look at every transaction. That, and you're not asking for that. That's not what I'm asking for. That's why I was correct. I mean, you're, you're asking, excuse me, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Please complete. No, go ahead. Uh, the, the bond issuance thing, we, we haven't discussed it at all. Uh, we being myself and Dr. Liggins and the CFO, uh, I'm other than just having read about it in the, uh, the online paper, uh, I really have no knowledge of that. So I, I'm yet to, to scale that learning curve. I can assure you, I mean, and, um, again, if you have concerns specific like that, if you'll let me know that uh, outside of this meeting, I, I'm certainly taking note of it tonight. I think it's going to be note of by someone so they can give it back to me after this meeting. But if it's of concern to you, then it will be considered, certainly. And to the extent that it's reviewed, I, I can't give you an answer to that. Yeah, I have no specifics. I'm not here to, to discuss specifics. But when you've got that much wash of cash, $72.5 million, to set an account you know, for a year, you have those line items that would have been budgeted. And if the capital expenditure size is where you could pull some sizable amounts of, of things, fiscal things, you know, where it be improvements, like I said, equipment, different things of that nature, you can pull down those capital line item budgets and it not show up because you've got that wash of cash over there that you're co-mingling with the general budget is what I'm trying to say. That's what I would like to look at. Okay. If you don't really understand, understand what I'm saying, I can oh, sit oh, down and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, I do understand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I've heard the expression, the only reason for looking back to the past is to learn from it, and I trust we will learn a lot. But Dr. Liggins, in going forward, as we always should look, what are we doing to prevent this sort of thing happening again? Are there any specific steps? Are we uh, balancing our checkbook? You know, what are we doing? Yes, we're, we're doing quite a few things. The task of audit uh, revealed that there were quite a bit of procedural things um, that could be more aligned and more systematic approaches to those. And so every single um, recommendation we receive from the task bill, um, procedural audit has been put into place. Um, and so we're making absolutely sure that at the end of each month that we're you know, reconciling our books and making sure that we're sure where we're at um, every step along the way. And just um, also with the um, hiring of the a new CFO. Um, I will tell you, there's been mentioned to multiple CFOs, there's, um, there was the last, I've been here 10 months now, and um, I've, there's been one CFO, an interim, and then a permanent CFO. Um, and then the interim came in in between the two. So there's, um, been, since I've been here, I do understand that before I arrived in December, there was another CFO. Um, but with the current CFO we have, um, I was very diligent in making, ensuring that 
we have an interim until we could successfully find someone that met the qualifications that we needed. And the CFO that um, we hired came with over 20 years experience in a similar size district that has have done some of everything. And so um, I'm very confident that with the new leadership in our finance department that we are totally uh, putting things into place that would put us on the long term to ensure that our procedures are in place, checks and balances are in place, and that we will not find ourselves in this situation again. Um, and, so this will, and so this will continue to be monitored? Absolutely, yes ma'am. Mr. Alexander, I just have one final quick question tonight. Based on the previous comments of teachers and employees and faculty afraid to speak out, is there a possibility that you could create a secure portal on your website or through email where those employees could submit anonymously concerns or known areas to look at without fear, any fear of reprisal? In fact, we've already discussed that, and this should change any moment now to include a mailing address where people can send confidential things. Do realize that the email is traceable, so we'll put a mailing address to where if, I, I don't know if that's something else you'd like to provide, but... Um. Well, certainly, um, um, to the extent someone is wanting to meet uh, outside of the district office uh, offices, you know, or not to be seen, but to be heard by me, uh, and they want to be confidential or anonymous, even to the extent I know who they are. You know, I leave their name and, and their information out of the notes. What I'm looking for is the information that will lead me to the evidence and the proof necessary to prove up their concerns. That said, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of input. Thank you. And additionally, I would like to address that because it's been mentioned by um, a couple of people at least. Um, Board policy, um, district policy, dictates um, retaliation and laws of that sort that uh, prevents us from doing it. But additionally, just ethically, as a leader, as an educational leader, as a superintendent, um, I think I, again, can speak for the board as well. That is not the way we operate. I, I, in the last 10 months, if I've shown someone they felt like I retaliated against them. They felt that there was a need. I don't know if that was a culture that existed before I arrived, but I can absolutely assure you that um, I'm comfortable with anyone coming to the central office or if you prefer to go elsewhere, but if I saw you or I think any of the staff at the central office saw you, I don't think anyone should be in fear of retaliation of their jobs. Um, we are just as interested in getting to the bottom of this. If you have information that's absolutely needed in order for us to, to find out anything that's going on in our finances, we are more than willing and able and um, hoping you'll come forward with that information. So it's actually much appreciated. I think we have a couple, one more question in the same. Is on now. May I add, uh, just to conclude the um, the uh, previous question, um, my notes, you know, when I discuss and take interview notes, uh, whether it's on site or off, uh, to the extent, even when there are names, you know, associated with comments that are made um, and documents that are given, that type of thing, uh, those documents go in my work papers, which, as I'm sure many of you may know, are the property of the CBA. You know, those work papers are not given back to the district. You know, those are mine, uh, and I work for those. The only thing from, that's out of my work product that goes back to the district will be the, the report, you know, the, the written report itself, and of course, the, the evidence needed to support that. Again, I'm trying to give assurance, you know, that uh, to the extent I do speak with people and take notes, teachers, anyone that's willing to come forward, certainly anything that can help, you know, better focus this examination and, uh, and keep the time on track, if you will, would be appreciated. Uh, good evening. I'm Charles Davidson. I've, uh, I actually started my uh, Greenville experience, first grade Old Bowie School. I was in the first first grade class and it was brand new. In fact, I have a brick on my mantle at home from Bowie School uh, since they've torn it down. Um, I've had three children that uh, went through the Greenville uh, ISD and uh, did very well in their careers. Uh, so I've uh, 
I've got a lot of pride in that, and I also spent tw uh, 18 years here teaching at the high school, uh, retiring in 2015. Um, I did not intend to speak tonight, but I did want to bring something uh, to your attention. Uh, I uh, kind of make that a habit of reading about Greenville ISD every chance I get, see what's going on up here still, I even pop in through the halls every once in a while to make sure that everything is going well, because uh, I feel like I, I have ownership here as well as a taxpayer too. Um, and uh, the thing I've noticed over the last few years is that occasionally, I said, not occasionally, but about once a year, I look in the uh, Greenville paper and I see that Greenville has received another Financial Accountability Award from the Texas Education Agency. <laughs> and they received one in, on October 10 of 2017 as well. I just read that on, uh, online just a few minutes ago from my seat. Uh, they keep getting these awards. Uh, by, uh, I was, uh, and still am, just totally amazed and shocked that the district has this kind of a problem after receiving awards from the TEA. And uh, I believe the TEA would be very concerned about this too and want to be informed that we do have a problem like this and they're awarding Greenville ISD awards for outstanding accountability and finances when this is not the case. And, uh, uh, I would uh, encourage you to uh, check with our local CPAs, I'm sure you'll be working with those five folks uh, that we have employed through the Greenville ISD, uh, and to just kind of see how, how it is that this is getting by them as well, uh, as well as the taxpayers in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lincolns, I was just wanted clarification. Yes, sir. I, I can't hear well in this environment either, so did you just say that You've only worked with one interim CFO? Yes. So when Gary Soros was here, he was an interim. No, he was a CFO. He was appointed right after. And then and then Dan was the interim. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I think we have allowed an extra almost 30 minutes. Um, in addition to our appointed time and our advertised time of 8 p.m., the, the first time is now 7.25, man. You mean we're just now at 7.30? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Terry, for resting your case on that one. I'm sorry, let's keep going. Are there any more? Do we have any more? We've got another 30 minutes to go. If there are no more um, people to speak at this time, we can close the meeting. This meeting is adjourned. We will have an address up there. And let me make sure that you understand that we are having this discussion, this meeting tonight, so that those persons who have anything to say to the board or to the superintendent or to our forensic auditor. We are having this because GISD, the board in particular, which is made up of uh, seven 
moral and ethical per persons want everybody in this district to, to feel that what they need is transparency, that we are being transparent. We want you to know that. That is the reason for this meeting tonight. And we're going to get that address up there so that those of you who want to talk with Mr. Alexander can do so at your own time. It will also be posted on the website. It is also posted on the website. Thank you very much. Did we adjourn? We are adjourned. $300 on any of your insurance will give you $30. We have been in Greenville for almost 30 years at 9801 Wesley Street. Our phone number is 903-274-4949. And web address is allstatefriendlyinsurance.com. Give my folks a call. See if we can save you $300 on any of your insurance or we'll give you $30 at 903-274-4949. God bless.